Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, an ARC UK seminar on the role of reintroductions in rewilding. Uh, tonight we're going to be um, chaired by our trustee Nicola Morris, who is, as well as our ARC UK trustee, is now going to pick her up, Head of Environment and Engagement at the Southwest Lakes, where she was formula, form, formerly uh, Alien Species Officer. So she's very experienced in this area. I'm going to hand over to you now, Nicola, and off you go. Thank you, Angie. Uh, lovely to see so many people here this evening. Uh, great to have you all on board. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us uh, this evening. It's set to be a really interesting evening of talks, one which we're, I'm sure we're all going to find really interesting and informative. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest speakers this evening. So we have Chris Cleed Owen, who is the Director and Principal Ecologist at CGO Ecology, John Baker from ARG UK and Amphibian Reptile Conservation, and Mark Elliott from Devon Wildlife Trust. So thank you to all of our guest speakers this evening. Um, please do ask any questions that you'd like to put to our guest speakers in the chat box. And at the end of each of those talks, we'll do our very best to get through as many questions as we can. Um, the evening is being recorded, so um, please do um, continue to ask questions afterwards and, and revisit the, the recording later on on YouTube when it's there. So uh, without further ado, as they say, um, I'd like to hand you over first of all to Chris Cleed Owen, who is going to present to us his uh, paleoarchaeological research into amphibian and reptile remains from quaternary sites in British Isles um, to shine a light onto what constitutes a native species. Um, so over to you, Chris. Okay, thank you, Claire. And thank you, Angie, for organising this and inviting me. Um, I'll try and share screen now. Um, tell me if it doesn't work. Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah, okay. Right, so this is very exciting and uh, just a, a little nerve-wracking. Um, especially given that I haven't spoken about this sort of stuff for about 20 years. Uh, this is what I did my PhD on 25 years ago, more or less. Um, and in those days, when you give a presentation, it was all on OHPs and traditional slides and things. So I've been scrabbling around trying to find material to put together a PowerPoint for all this stuff. So bear with me anyway. So uh, there's the title. Um, you've read it by now, I'm sure. So it's just a whistle stop tour through subfossil record of uh, you know what um, what we know about our amphibians and reptiles in the UK. So just to uh, summarize the native uh, what we accept as the native uh, herpeta fauna of the British Isles in general is six reptiles, uh, three lizards, three snakes and seven amphibians so three newts and three was three frogs and toads it's now four since the bullfrog was reintroduced. Um, and they, they are typified by a wide um, difference in their, in their ranges and their ecological strategies and niches. For example, the common toad on the left is found throughout the whole of, the, well, the whole of Britain uh, and quite a few islands. Uh, on the right, the Natterjack toad has got a very scant distribution along um, coastlines mainly, east and west coast. And this is very um, telling about its history and its prehistory, as we'll come to later. So the same goes with the, with the reptiles. Common lizard is found more or less over the whole of the British landmass, and um, sand lizard, conversely, is only found in a few scattered locations, which are disjunct. And so clearly, at some point, they've, they've managed to get where they are. So they were probably more widespread and more common at some point in the past. So just to start to um, introduce a few of the concepts that you need to um, consider when looking at what, uh, consider what, where our native herbs came from, is you have to understand that um, the climate history in the last two million years has been one of great fluctuation between warm periods like we're in now, known as interglacials, and cold periods known as uh, glaciations or ice ages. Um, and during that time, climate, of course, in Britain has rapidly fluctuated. We've been covered in ice sheets at various times, and then they've withdrawn. 
animals and plants have managed to come back in again. So uh, these graphs here show how rapidly and how dramatically climate has fluctuated over the last 450,000 years, uh, but it's been for, for about a million years we've been going through this cycle of ice ages. Focusing on the last 20,000 years, which takes us from the end of the last ice age or from the peak of the last ice age through till present day, we go from left to right there. Climate has gone from a cold temperature through to much higher temperatures around 13, 14,000 years ago. Then it went back into what we call uh, the Younger Dryas period. So it was another mini ice age for a thousand years. And then about 12,000 years ago, the climate warmed to more or less what it is today. It's fluctuated a lot in that last 12,000 years. And these smoothed curves here show how it has um, varied quite a bit. Um, on average, climate has been most of the time in the last 12,000 years approximately what it is today, but there was a period between five and 8,000 years ago when climate was up to three degrees warmer than it is today. Now that's, for example, that's average uh, summer temperatures would have been three degrees warmer. That would take us, say, five or 6,000 years ago, that would take us to the climate of the middle of France. So you can imagine how some things might have survived then that don't survive now, for example. And even in the last thousand years, look at the bottom graph, that's the last thousand years, um, climate has dropped significantly in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries um, in the what we call the Little Ice Age. And then it's back up to its uh, medieval sort of temperatures now. During that period of the last 20,000 years, the geography of the, of the British landmass has changed a lot as well, because we were connected to Europe. Um, well, we were a year ago as well, but uh, we, we won't go into that subject. Um, we, are, we were connected uh, to Europe by land for much of the last 20,000 years. It was only about 6,000 years ago that we that the land bridge was finally drowned. Now, this was because sea levels were rising at the end of the last ice age, because all those ice sheets were melting and putting water back into the sea. Now, during the peak of the last ice age, uh, the sea levels globally were about 130 metres below what they are now. That's quite a dramatic drop. So uh, Britain was connected to Ireland and to Europe. Uh, Alaska was connected to Eastern Russia, for example allowing all sorts of fauna and flora to cross. Um, so what do we know about the subfossil record of the amphibians and reptiles that we have here today? Well, all of the evidence comes from, um, because this is prehistory we're talking about, it all comes from archaeological and paleontological uh, excavations. So uh, archaeology study of the human past um, paleontology is more um, broad than that. It's the study of the past of all animals and plants. Um, we use this term zooarchaeology, which is the archaeology of animals and plants <clears throat> quite a lot. So this is kind of zooarchaeological studies we're talking about here. So there are lots of excavations going all over the country all the time in caves and in Iron Age uh, forts and villages and things like that. And these produce vast amounts of um, small vertebrate remains, which are sieved out of soil samples and then recovered um, under a low power microscope. And uh, people like me who study these have our own comparative collections, which we've, uh, which we've built up. And we've, I, I taught myself how to identify all the different bones in the skeleton of all the reptiles and amphibians in, in the UK. And anyone who knows who knew me back then in the mid 90s will know that I always had a freezer full of uh, roadkill frogs and snakes and things. And that's how I prepared all the skeletons from those. Um, and so it's a bit of a niche interest, shall we say. Um, and eventually I've come to uh, produce an awful lot of data, which still barely scratches the surface. Um, before my PhD, there were about 40 known sites with 
what we call subfossil remains of amphibians and reptiles in the UK. Subfossil, uh, basically the bones are buried in soil. They're in the process of turning into stone, but they're not. Uh, they're not fossilized yet. So uh, archaeological bones, we could say. Um, by the end of my PhD, 1998, uh, it was up to about 75 sites. So you can deduce that I studied about 35 sites for my PhD. Um, but they were still all clustered in the east of England, particularly around um, the Fens and that sort of area. Um, and there was a, there's a good reason for that, which will become clear later on. Um, by 2003, five years later, it was up to 125 sites because I'd been studying a lot of um, material specifically looking for evidence of the pool frog in, the, in Britain. Um, it's still all focused on the east of England, of course, for that, for that reason. Uh, now in 2021, we're up to about, I, ha I have data from about 150 sites, let's say, but I don't have a map of that. Uh, what I can tell you though, is that the same gaps remain. There are still virtually no records of anything from the south coast. Now there are archeological sites going on all the time on the south coast, but um, it's only ones that have got good small bone preservation, which are gonna be any use. So any of the heathland areas, uh, because of the acid substrate, they don't preserve small bones. Um, so there's nothing from Dorset at all that I'm aware of. So there are obviously lots of gap, gaps are there to be filled. I'm always keen to look at new material, so that will happen in the future. Um, every single animal which dies, uh, every vertebrate has a lot of bones and any one of those can be preserved. Um, some of them are more useful than others. Uh, there's a bone in the skull of frogs and toads called the frontoparietal, there's two of them. And they're very diagnostic of species but they're very rarely preserved because they're such a delicate piece of bone. On the other hand, there are two bones in the pelvis called the ilia, which are also very diagnostic and they are preserved. So um, thankfully we can get down to species and a lot of um, subfossil remains. Snakes have got hundreds of, uh, hundreds of vertebrae, hundreds of ribs. The vertebrae actually very diagnostic of species. So Luckily, we all we need is one vertebra and we can say that, well, grass snake has been here at this time in the past or adder has been here. Um, newts and lizards are a bit more tricky. Their bones are very small. They don't preserve very well. Um, the one exception is the bottom right hand picture there is of the bony scales of the slow worm. Every single slow worm contains about 5,000 bony scales plus several hundred vertebrae and uh, other bones that could preserve. Um, so each one of those bony osteoderms will tell you that slow worms were there at a certain place at a certain time in the past. All well, my data is all compiled into uh, um, tables like this, which I wrote my PhD on. Um, I've got a paper copy of it. A Coventry University still has actually got a digital copy of it online. If anyone wants to track it down, a lot of the stuff is, some of the stuff is published, some of it never got published, I'm afraid. Um, if I can summarise, though, what we know about each of the species, the um, common frog is very commonly found. Nearly every archaeological site I've ever looked at has got common frog in it, and that's been there ever since the late glacial period, sort of the last 15,000 years onwards, all the way through the Holocene. Holocene is what we call the, the warm period that we're in now that's been happening for about 12,000 years. Common toad similarly was uh, there very early on and has uh, is commonly found in archaeological sites. Slow worm similarly uh, has been there for most of the last 15,000 years and is commonly found. Ones that are less frequently, still fairly frequently found, but not as commonly, grass snake. I've only got evidence of the grass snake from the mid Holocene onwards. So I think the grass snake was actually quite a late arrival um it's not it's not been it wasn't there in the late glacial it wasn't one of the earliest ones to arrive certainly common lizard was there right from the start very early colonist great crested newt is like grass snake it was a bit of a late arrival only arrived in the holocene period uh, smooth newt has always been there very early arrival adder was a very early arrival 
but it's not very often found. So only find it in places like today, you only find it in places where there's not much human activity. So it doesn't coincide with um, archeological sites very often. The same reasons it doesn't coincide with human habitation today. Um, the interesting one is the Natterjack toad because it's, it's quite rarely found in subfossil context, but where it is found, it's nearly always in places in the country where you wouldn't find it today, interestingly. Um, surprisingly, sand lizard and smooth snake, I've never found. Never found bones of sand lizard and smooth snake anywhere. Now, there's probably a good reason for that. They have probably always occupied heathland areas with acid substrates, <coughs> coastal areas, <coughs> excuse me, and they have um, the bones have never really preserved very well. Uh, so this map on the right here shows you the some of the sites where I found natterjacks. Uh, found them in caves in North Wales, a place where they're no longer present. South West Wales, Pembrokeshire, in a couple of places there. Again, not no longer present. Um, the Wye Valley, North Somerset, South Devon, um, Kent, and even somewhere in West London called Chiswick. So there's a lot of places where natterjack bones turn up, even as recently as sort of medieval times, where uh, we've got no inkling that they were present historically. Um, as I said, conspicuous by their absence are sand lizard and smooth snake. Uh, well, I suppose what we really want to be talking about here, and a lot of people are mainly interested in, is is there any subfossil evidence for other species being native in the past? So um, let's compare what we have today and what we have the evidence for in the past. Now, newts, we have three today and we only have evidence for three. Frogs and toads, we have four natives today and we have evidence in the past uh, for six. Terrapins and turtles, they're currently none, but we have evidence for one since the last ice age, um, i.e. previously native at some point, we have uh, European pond terrapin. Uh, lizards, we've got three species today, but we still only got any evidence at all of one of them. That's a common lizard. Snakes, we have three today, and we only have evidence of three in the last 15,000 years. So uh, pond terrapin, European pond terrapin, um, was found at one site in East Anglia about five to 8,000 years ago. Bullfrog, agile frog, and moor frog. I found all three of these species also in the Fens and East Anglia, that sort of part of the country. Interestingly, of course, that is where the last land bridge was, was from uh, Holland and Belgium across to what was Doggerland, which is this drowned area that's um, a shallow part of the North Sea, um, and across to Norfolk. And the last land bridge was to Norfolk. It wasn't to um, Dover, as we might imagine, it was to Norfolk. Hence, um, it's not that much of a surprise to find the um, pool frog um, last sites in that part of the world as well. So these are the bones of the, um, the two individuals of uh, European pond terrapin, which were dug up about 100 years ago in Norfolk, a place called East Retham, and they are supposedly around about five to 8,000 years old, which would be the period when the land bridge was still there and climate was warmer than it is today. And these are in the University of Cambridge um, Zoological Museum. Um, I found bones of the pool frog in two places in East Anglia, and this was one of the lines of evidence which was used to reintroduce it. Um, the others being the genetic um, differences in the northern clay that was surviving in Norfolk and Scandinavia, and also bioacoustic evidence and some historical research. Um, I also published a paper which suggested that um, two other species, um, moor frog and agile frog, were, could be classed as natives as well because they only went extinct in the last thousand years or so. All three of these species were present about a thousand years ago, um, or thereabouts. So this is one of the bones of the pool frog. That's a bone of agile frog from a Middle Saxon site, so about thousand to twelve hundred years ago um, in Lincolnshire. And here's one of um, the moor frog, Rana arvalis, from a Middle Saxon site in Norfolk. 
But what about the other species we might uh, expect to be here? There are a few which are present just across the channel and would quite happily survive here. And we know that because people have been, have been introducing them for the last 100 years or more. The wall lizard, that's doing very well all over um, southern Britain, from you know across England and Wales. Uh, why isn't that here? Well, remember that the last land bridge was across a very low, probably quite wet, um, grassy plain across what is now under the North Sea. So it wasn't really the sort of habitat that all lizards could, could have easily have traversed. Tree frogs, on the other hand, they really ought to have been there, perhaps. Um, so yeah, they, they could well have got across. And the same for marsh frog and edible frog. Um, we, what we do know, though, is that the marsh frog and edible frog and the southern clades of the pool frog um, were late arrivals to northern Europe and probably the land bridge had gone by then. So finally, I think I'm just about out of time. What constitutes nativeness? Well, I did a quick search. Um, uh, IUCN hasn't, I couldn't find a definition of nativeness. It's got a definition of non-nativeness and invasiveness and the same with the DEFRA's um, non-native species secretariat, but so I took to Google and generally nativeness is this concept of being um, from a region or an area by birth or other definition of origin. Um, it's a hot topic and it has been for a long time. This is a paper from 20 years ago where uh, they're describing uh, the, you know, the various definitions of native and uh, SNH had at the time defined six, six um, types of native and non-native, not just two. Um, this is another paper here where um, there's, well, actually it's a whole chapter in a book on the subject. What defies nativeness? Another paper here only a few years ago uh, where the authors are trying to um, get broad acceptance that native should be anything that hasn't been assisted by humans. So even if it seems to be an accidental um, or, or a recent arrival in an area where it's not part of its normal range, if it wasn't assisted by humans, it should be classed as native. Um, and yep, even, even now it's a hot topic in uh, conservation and urban greening and all that sort of stuff. So I ha that's been a whistle stop tour. Um, I, hadn't, I haven't managed to cram in a lot of stuff I could have spoken about, but I think that's probably enough for now. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. As you say, it's a, um, it's a, it can be a pretty in-depth subject that demands quite a lot of time. So it's really good that you've managed to provide us with such a nice, concise explanation today. So thank you for that. Um, OK, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, we have one from Nick who asks, could humans have brought the pond turtle across Doggerland for food? They could, but far less likely explanation than them getting here naturally. They would, they would, they, they would have been here um, all the time that humans were there. I don't see why humans would have had to have brought them for food. The habitat would have been ideal for them, sort of low, marshy, undulating. Thank you, Chris. Um, Pete asks, thank, uh, he says, thank you, Chris. Do we know if hylobones preserve well? Uh, good question. Not, not brilliantly, but they do preserve well enough. We have found them before in the Pleistocene. So I didn't have time to show you the full fossil record of the last two million years, subfossil record. But if you include everything that's been found over the last million years or so, there are actually about 10 or 12 species that are not found today, which were found then. And that includes um, Hyla, two species of Hyla, in fact, um, Meridionalis and Arborea were here. Um, Aesculapian snake was here at several times in the past. Um, Dice snake was here several times in the past. Um, Spadefoot toad, parsley frog, um, and Martian edible frogs were here at certain times in the past. They were in previous interglacials where it was known to be a few degrees warmer than it is today. So um, yeah, all of the species do
do preserve well in in theory it's but it's if the, if there isn't the old saying goes if uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence exactly yeah um great answer thank you chris um brian asks linked to that how warm was it when agile and more frogs were here i uh, would say it's probably about the same as today possibly slightly warmer but um they it certainly wasn't any cooler than today and if you look at the current range of agile frog today it's actually it's got a western front it's got an unusual shape of range and it's actually it ends probably it naturally ends somewhere in the north sea if you extrapolated where it goes it would end in the north sea so i think the climate has got more continental um or well i would no, possibly got less continental in the last thousand years maybe the more frog is a bit more continental so um it just doesn't survive the oceanic climate we've got now of um cooler summers and more more cloudy weather for example great thank you um harvey has uh, an interesting point to make and um, he says with warming climate change pond turtles could breed here by 2040 using the iucn's assisted colonization colonization why don't we bring them back or aspire? So it's an interesting point, slightly different from um, the definition of reintroductions, but certainly something that we need to be thinking about for the future. So um, have you uh, have you got any thoughts on that, Chris? Well, I'm sure there are probably some pond terrapins somewhere in somebody's greenhouse that are already breeding now. And they probably always have. There are probably red, red ear terrapins that are breeding now in the in the UK. Um, yeah, they, they could, they could breed now in certain circumstances and they probably have in the past some of the some of the hot summers we've had in the last few years they could have they could have bred um but whether to bring them bring them back or not um it depends where you set the bar of um what is what should we aspire to reintroduce because they were here naturally i'm pretty sure of that i don't, I don't see any reason to think why humans brought them here because everything else got here by its own accord um, it's just that going back 5,000 years to something that went extinct 5,000 years ago, is that what we want to do? That's a, that's a bigger debate to be had. Um, that's different to things that we extirpated ourselves um, through hunting or land drainage, which is my view of why the, the, the additional frogs have gone extinct in the last thousand years is probably because of fenland drainage and the growth of agriculture. Um, Thank you, Chris. It's, it's a whole um, a whole discussion for another another seminar, I think. So, uh, but yeah, thank you for that. We um, had one seminar on each. Can we have a go at the first poll on that note then? Because that yeah, of course we can. Yeah. Now we're going to hold the breath and make sure the poll works. Here we go. Um, so, if I launch that, so there's two questions there. Um, if everybody has a go at those. Can we have a go at those? Can you see it, Nicola? I can, yeah, I can see it. So we've got... Um... Oh yeah, people are voting now. That's yep, it. Brilliant, brilliant. Two questions there. One is about um, whether resources should be spent on reintroducing formerly extinct species or should they be focused on conservation of existing native resident species? And the second question... <laughs> It's about whether there should be a programme to boost populations of existing native species through reintroductions. So there's been concerns, I've heard it mentioned for common toad and adder, where people think um, if you could head start them and release them, would that go some way to mitigating the declines we're seeing? So we'll let that run a little bit and then I can write down the answers. We, we've got a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic. And we can't get to um, during the course of this evening. Um, actually, if our panellists can, can go onto the chat and the, and the Q&As, we may well be able to, to answer some of those more directly. Um, I've got an interesting one from Mark, um, who asked, are you interested in new bones to examine from digs around the UK? I guess it depends on how much work you want to take on, Chris. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So, uh, so Mark asks, are you interested in new bones to examine from digs around the UK? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm still in touch with a lot of people in archaeology. I think people have just forgotten over the years. Um, they, I, I get um, assemblages sent about once a year. I teach at Bournemouth University every year, the archaeology students, once or twice. Um, and I study stuff in 
Spain, Gibraltar, Turkey and things for other people. But um, if, in the UK, yes, I would always welcome stuff to be sent. But um, I'd probably want to have a discussion first about what, what they've got, because um, I've, you know, I can go through tens of thousands of bones of common frog and toads, and you know, there's no point doing that if it's not from a part of the country with interesting species. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, with the first question, um, focus on conservation of current native species, 61%. Reintroduction, reintroduce some former, formerly extinct species, 35% and not sure was 10%. And then with the second question, should there be a programme to boost populations of existing native species through reintroductions, e.g. common toad and adder, that have undergone significant declines? Yes, 65%, no, 5%, some species, 22%, and 9% said not sure. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. He's posted uh, some information for people hoping to get into ecology in the chat there. Um, we've got lots of people interested in that, which is great. So do have a look at that. Um, and as I say, we'll try and get to some more of your questions as we're going through the evening. So there's some really good ones coming in and some really nice comments as well. It's good to have a really good balance here. Okay, great. Thanks so much for that, Chris. Um, now we're going to um, move on to our next speaker. Um, so we've now got um, John Baker. Uh, John manages the Pool Frog Recovery Project for um, Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust. Um, he's been involved with reintroduction of the northern pool frog since 2004. Um, and he's also a trustee um, along with us of Arg UK. So over to you, John. Thank you. Hey, is that working? Yeah. OK, thank you very much for that introduction, Nicola. Um, I'm going to talk about rewilding and amphibian reintroductions. I was uh, given the job of talking about pool frogs, but there's so much to cover. I'm going to be talking about pool frogs rather less than I would have hoped. John, do you think you could just um, maximise the window of your um, presentation for us, please? Does that make a difference? Cool. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Is that better? That's ideal. Thank you. Yep. Lovely. Okay. Um, it seems the uh, rewilding goes back originally to it's an American idea. And I think one of the seminal papers is a paper by Soule and Ross. And some of the things they talk about are having large core protected reserves, having habitat connectivity, connectivity between the cores and surrounding habitats. And also they're focused on having keystone species. So these are species that affect and shape the environment. Um, there is an IUCN, Rewilding Thematic Group, and rather helpfully, they give a definition and they call rewilding, or they describe it as the process of rebuilding natural ecosystems after human disturbance. And they emphasize minimum or no human intervention. They give 10 principles of rewilding, and the first one is relevant to us. It's rewilding utilizes wildlife to restore trophic interactions. So successful rewilding is nature led and relies on accommodating predation, competition, and other biotic and abiotic interactions. Where appropriate, interactive keystone species that have roles in maintaining the ecosystem should be reintroduced or reinforced. So right from the get go, the American concept of rewilding very much involved reintroductions. Um, the rewilding idea has been adopted in Europe and including the UK and in moving across the Atlantic, it has changed in emphasis and it's now got various interpretations. And one of the reasons that it's uh, got a different interpretation in the United Kingdom is probably simply the issue of space. We simply don't have space, particularly in lowland Britain, to have large numbers of keystone species. An example of that would be wolves. So you can imagine there's not a lot of places in um, England or the United Kingdom where you have areas large enough to support wolves and you can guarantee they would get complaints from neighbours. It's just not a straightforward pros prospect for this country. Um, nevertheless, within the various interpretations of rewilding, there are some common themes that emerge. One of those is letting natural processes take control, um, ideally working over large areas of land, but not always large areas. Um, there's also benefits of rewilding small areas of land, particularly arable land reverting to um, natural systems or being let go. And in particular, there's no defined outcomes. And that means that um, this is a sort of contrast between some conventional conservation whereby 
you may be managing a site for a particular habitat or a particular species. So you may aim, you may have habitat management targets to ensure the survival of those species or habitats. With rewilding, it's very much a question of stepping back a bit and letting nature take control and see what happens. And it also seems that some people are just using um, rewilding as alternative um, terminology to wildlife conservation. Right, um, this uh, webinar that we're having today was very much prompted by a lot of attention that's been gathered by um, speculation about unregulated introductions. So um, just want to talk about those a little bit. They seem to be very much driven by captive breeders or herpetoculturalists, people who keep and breed amphibians and reptiles in captivity. And the idea being pushed is extremely appealing. If your species is in decline, breed some more and let them go. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, the media seem to have lapped this up. Um, and also there seem to be a, a bit of uh, disaffectation with the establishment. And, and that's completely understandable. I um, mean, if, if you've been involved in wildlife conservation, as I have for a long time, and you look at the long term trends, it's all pretty grim. You take a look at the state of nature reports that deal with the United Kingdom. And there are some populations or some species that are increasing. But in general, the long term trends are pretty much downward. And one way of looking at that is to say, well, nature conservation so far hasn't worked very well. Um, and so that's where this disaffectation comes from. Of course, the counter argument is, is that, well, actually, there's quite big forces at play here and things would be a much lot uh, worse off if we hadn't had the, con the interactions or the interventions that the existing conservation bodies and, and um, statutory bodies have been involved in to date. So there's a debate to be had there, but it is completely understandable that people should be fairly fed up with the way things are. This idea of letting things go, um, <clears throat> mainly because we quite like them, isn't new. If you go back to um, some time, uh, historically, we had acclimatization societies. First ones of those were formed in the 1850s and in the United Kingdom. We had the Society for the Acclimatization of Animals, Birds, Fishes, Insects and Vegetables within the United Kingdom. There were acclimatization societies in other parts of the world as well, and they had mixed motivations. But in general, they aimed to enrich local biodiversity. And this was a two way thing. Um, in, in Britain, I think it was a little bit colonial. Um, sometimes people like to introduce good old British species to far parts of the world, including or especially areas we have colonized at one point. But there's also an issue of bringing animals from abroad to enrich our local fauna and flora. And um, some of the results of this sort of activity have been things like uh, establishing rabbits in Australia or establishing starlings in North America. Um, primarily on the basis that somebody felt that it was important that uh, all the birds that were mentioned in the works of Shakespeare should actually be present in the United States. And uh, this is what happened historically. I would like to think that our understanding of moving things about has changed. And so we should be viewing things differently. So if we're talking about reintroductions today, they're actually a little bit more complicated in practice than they might first seem. Um, for example, to do them well, it can be quite costly, especially compared to the alternative. So if you're looking at a range of conservation options, um, reintroductions are not always the most efficient. And for example, um, a more efficient um, way of, well, somebody just mentioned talking about should we be releasing adders and common toads um, to boost existing populations? I would say it's almost nonsensical to be thinking about breeding common toads to address declines. With common toads, if they're not there, the reason they're not there is because the habitat is either no longer present or it's been damaged in some way. So if you want to get common toads back, the most efficient option is to address the habitat issues. And if you get that right, then the animals almost in all cases are going to move back in themselves. It's slightly different for the very rare species, because even if you restore the habitats, they physically, in some cases, or in most cases, they can't get there. Um, precisely because they are rare and they're confined to very limited areas. So in practice, um, reintroductions as a conservation option um, often turn out to be the option of last choice. And another factor or another issue that's extremely important is that reintroductions um, come with some risks. They are not risk free. And we need to think about that quite carefully, um, particularly with amphibians. 
And another issue that slightly worries me about reintroductions, um, and this is from somebody who works on reintroductions, is that in some ways they can be a bit of a distraction from the real problems. So one thing that worries me about these uh, speculative rogue reintroductions is they're really playing into the hands of the political establishment. I'm sure there's a lot of politicians out there that would like to think, fantastic, let's support reintroductions because that's a lot easier than dealing with the real issues, which are habitat loss, fragmentation and um, degradation. So um, you've got to be careful that with reintroductions, as I said, we don't play into the hands of the political establishment. Right, I've talked about reintroductions having risks, so I'll just expand a little bit on two of those risks. The first risk being the risk of disease, and the second one I'll deal with first, and that's a risk that's been described as gene escape. And for that, I can talk about pool frogs for a little bit. This is the European range of the pool frog. The green area is the range over most of continental Europe. It actually goes a lot further into Russia. It's a huge global range. At the northern edge of this range, you've got some outlying populations. And the pool frogs here, they look a bit different, they behave a bit differently, they sound a bit different, and in fact, they're genetically a little bit different to pool frogs in the bulk of the range. So these northern pool frogs, they form a northern group or a northern clade. And the populations or the pool frogs that you live in England were part of this northern clade. So once native status has been determined, um, they were reintroduced using stock from Sweden because they are the same northern pool frogs. And this is quite unusual because most of the species we have in England or Britain or the United Kingdom are very abundant elsewhere in Europe. It's quite unusual to have something within England that is actually quite scarce in Europe. So we've got an international obligation towards the northern pool frog. Um, and because of that, um, one potential threat to the current introduction um, project would be an unregulated release that allowed frogs of an unknown genetic origin or a mixed genetic origin to actually mix with the Swedish pool frogs. That would be a disaster for the project. If you want to look at it in different terms, look at in, um, an example from the furry world is the Scottish wildcat. I think within conservation circles, conservationists recognise that the Scottish wildcat is extinct. And the reason it's extinct is eventually because of it's been hybridised with domestic felines which have been basically released. So you've got something that through genetic contamination has caused the extinction of a native species. It would be really sad to see the northern pool frog becoming extinct for the same reason due to an unregulated release. Um, a huge risk within amphibian conservation translocations or reintroductions is the disease risk. Um, and a particular issue is a fungus, uh, a microscopic fungus, a chytrid fungus, it is microscopic, it lives in the skin of amphibians. So if an amphibian is infected by this fungus, you can't see the fungus. And some species aren't particularly badly affected, so they can carry the fungus to species that are affected, and you can't health screen them just by looking at them. Um, this chytrid fungus, uh, in the issue of global amphibian declines or amphibians declining at different parts of the world, um, the chytrid fungus has been a key factor in that. Um, it was exemplified recently on one of David Attenborough's broadcasts. Um, he had footage of the golden frog waving from a stream in Central America. That frog is now extinct in the wild, wiped out by this chytrid fungus. And one of the researchers made a comment or, uh, on the chytrid fungus and described it. It's Petraca chytrium dendrobatidis. It's caused the most prominent loss of vertebrate diversity ever recorded. So chytrid is a significant risk to amphibians. Um, it's in the UK. It was first detected in the UK in North American bullfrogs. And this sort of links into this aspect of moving stuff about. The reason that chytrid is affecting amphibian populations around the world is because we have moved amphibians that are infected around the world. Um, we move amphibians about for various reasons. It's for the pet trade, it's for human consumption, and sometimes it's things like um, fishing bait. But essentially, moving amphibians around has a disease risk. And as it happens, a reintroduction is an example of moving something about. And chytrid disease has been involved in um, fairly serious, legitimate, um, regulated introductions or reintroductions. And a case of that is the Majorcan midwife toad. The Mallorcan midwife toad is a rare species, very limited range. It has been reintroduced to the wild 
um, but it has also carried chytrid fungus with it. And one of the reasons for that is um, this issue of cosmopolitan collections. A cosmopolitan collection simply refers to a collection of species that come from different parts of the world. So this is the sort of arrangement you'd expect to see in a zoo or many private collections. A private collection or a zoo may have animals from lots of different parts of the world, or even if they're not originally from different parts of the world, they'll have passed through the hands of other people who do have things from different parts of the world. So this issue of cosmopolitan collections massively increases the risk of infection of um, transfer of disease between collections and also eventually into the wild. Another example, um, instead of the just the case of the kid, the midwife toad, you've got the case of the fire salamander, um, an animal well known to people within um, the pet keeper community. Um, but a different species of chytrid has recently been discovered in Europe, the Traco chytrium salamandrivorans, and this has had huge, devastating impacts on the fire salamander populations in the Netherlands, also in neighbouring Germany. Uh, and neighbouring Belgium. So huge population crashes there. And again, the link is believed to be moving stuff about. It's thought that this particular chytrid has originated from Asian newts and the, 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 the transfer from Asia to um, Europe has been through released pets. Happening in Spain, 2018, um, this B cell or Petraca chytrium salamandrivorans, it's been detected in Spain and it's thought to have got there through introduced populations of alpine newts and Anatolian crested newts, and it's called mass mortality in native marble newts and threatens a, uh, another rarity. It's in the UK. It's not in the world in the UK, but this paper um, gives the quote or comes to the conclusion. Um, th this, these, uh, these investigations, Fitzpatrick and his colleagues were looking for salamandrivorans in captive collections, private collections. And they say that B-sal is likely widespread within the private amphibian trade, at least in Europe. That includes the UK. So B-sal is here in the UK, but is in captive collections. It is not yet in the wild. Right. Um, OK, unregulated um, introductions, they carry risks. Um, I'm not going to say that they're never successful. Well, there are some successes of unregulated reintroductions. That would include the starlings and the rabbits. I know that we think of this as an ecological disaster, but at the time, people just wanted to see these species established uh, abroad or um, yeah, in other countries. That has happened. Back home in the UK, um, one of the most successful reintroductions of natterjacks was unregulated. Um, war lizards are well known amongst the herpetological community as being established in over uh, many different sites very successfully. So depending on your definitions or criteria, that's an example of a very successful unregulated um, introduction. I also think it extends to beavers. Mark is going to be, Mark Elliott will be telling us more about that. Um, but I think the unregulated introduction of beavers has had positive um, benefits. Um, but Certainly looking at amphibians, the, the risks of unregulated introductions means that unregulated releases uh, can't really or can longer be regarded as conservation action. They pose a threat to wildlife ultimately. So I don't think we should be thinking about these things as a conservation option. Right, if you want to um, do a reintroduction properly, as Chris has alluded to, there is guidance, international guidelines from the IUCN. Um, these guidelines, they're, they're not that user friendly. It's very much a textbook of all the issues that need to be considered. So it's a bit like a textbook rather than a manual of how to do it. So I think we could improve the situation by maybe interpreting this guidance for the UK and maybe specifically for HERPS to make things a bit clearer. Um, and when the, uh, these guidelines talk about conservation translocations, and that includes reintroductions, which is released into an indigenous range, so putting things back to where they used to occur. But they also talk about conservation introductions, which is releasing outside indigenous range. So they are recognizing that um, introductions are not solely within historic ranges, but one of the things that they do stress, um, they very much take a risk assessment approach. They recognize there are risks to reintroductions and these risks have to be thoroughly considered. And they point out that the translocation of organisms outside of their indigenous range are considered to be especially high risk. Right, just to talk about pool frogs a little bit, to talk about how you might go through different stages of a reintroduction, um, as we did for pool frogs. As Chris has alluded to, he was involved in the first stages, which were 
a, a investigation of the evidence for native status. Um, a second stage, once the uh, native status had been determined, was to look at the causes of extinction. Um, and this is, is vitally important, um, and it might seem fairly obvious, but sometimes gets overlooked. There is absolutely no point of putting animals into the wild unless you worked out why they disappeared there in the first place, because there is always the possibility that you're just going to release your animals into exactly the same sort of negative situation that caused the extinction of the original animals in the first place. Um, so with the pool frogs, it was pretty much working out the drainage and probably changes in habitat management due to changes, actually less grazing of the sites they were on has probably caused their extinction and those issues have been addressed before animals were reintroduced. There's been a, a thorough um, assessment of risks and attempts made to minimise those. And in particular, we spent a lot of time thinking about the disease risks and assessing and minimising disease risks has been a constant thread that has kind of structured and guided the way the reintroduction programme has gone. Um, it's taken place legitimately, so it's gone through the regulatory process. We've had to do that because the pool frog is a European protected species. We've moved it from Sweden to the United Kingdom, so it's international translocation. It needs to get through regulation at both ends of the chain. And one of the reintroductions, the second introduction, has been onto a national nature reserve. So again, we've had to go through the necessary regulatory procedures. And that's quite useful because it allows a thorough evaluation and inspection of the previous steps that we've gone through. So going through the regulatory process is a way of getting extra pairs of eyes to look over the whole process and give it an assessment. So the whole project has been thoroughly planned. The planning includes a lot of monitoring and feedback. And that's really important, both to allow the current project to um, adapt if necessary, and it has adapted according to feedback, and also, ultimately, we want to monitor the project so that at the end of it, we can tell other people what has worked and hasn't worked. And so hopefully other um, reintroduction projects can benefit from the experiences that we've gone through. Right, just to home in a little bit on the um, assessing and minimising risks. I've talked about disease being particularly important. Um, the, reintroduction or the primary reintroduction was taking frogs from Sweden. There was no captive stage involved. Um, and, and that's for several reasons. One is, is that it completely or it massively reduces the risk of a disease because taking animals in captivity um, often involves getting them close to cosmopolitan um, collections and straight away the disease risk just rockets. So it's easier to go from one site to another and skip as much of captivity as you can in this case. And also um, it's just cheaper and easier. So the most efficient technique for um, introducing pool frogs has been a site to site translocation. So over a four year period, moved 90 adult frogs and 88 juveniles from Sweden to a site in Norfolk. At that site in Norfolk, um, they've settled down. They've been there since the reintroduction period. They're doing fine in the sense that they're still there. But the population established has not been quite as was anticipated. I think it was always assumed that if you successfully reintroduce an amphibian, um, you will have exponential population growth at some time and you will be able to take animals from that site to colonise future populations elsewhere in the United Kingdom. That was kind of the original plan. But as it turns out, the established population is quite small. It's about 50 or 60 adults. And one of the reasons for this is that pool frogs aren't as fecund as um, common frogs. They don't seem to be even as fecund as your bog standard pool frogs. They seem to produce fewer eggs. And it seems quite a typical situation that they exist in fairly small populations. And this means that we wouldn't be able to carry out another translocation to a secondary site on the same sort of scale as the primary reintroduction. If we've got 50 or 60 adults, then taking about 25 animals each year for four years is simply unsustainable. So the project has been modified and adapted, and it now involves a head starting element. Head starting um, in this sense, it means taking eggs from the wild population, hatching those out in captivity, rearing the tadpoles under protected conditions. So you're increasing their survival chances and you're generating a greater number of little froglets than would happen in the wild situation. And we're releasing those animals just before they turn into froglets. So we've started a head starting project and, and that's the project I've just started working on. 
funded by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, employing um, a couple of colleagues to do this for us. Right, as I said, um, biosecurity has been very much part of the project. Um, it was in, uh, we use the several elements of it. We, there's a lot of health screening. So when the animals were originally brought from Sweden, the source population was screened for health issues. Um, the amphibians already present at the reintroduction site in England, that's the common frogs, common toads and several newt species. They were also checked for disease. And um, as time has gone on, there's been ongoing health screening for the reintroduced population. So health screening has been um, an ongoing part of the project. And that's really important because, like I said, you can't see chytrid fungus. You can only detect it by um, looking at it in a lab. Um, we also, from a practical point of view, we use uh, dedicated kits. So when we're doing surveys, the field kit used at any particular site is only used on that site. We've got two sites for pool frogs at the moment. They've been successfully reintroduced to a second site, which is Thompson Common. Um, for each site, we've got separate survey kits and also for the head starting unit itself. All the stuff in there is only used there. It doesn't go out to the field. Um, and seems to be working as far as we can tell. Um, no signs of chytrid or any other significant diseases in the wild populations. And ironically, since the translocation, chytrid has been detected in Swedish pool frogs. And one of the risks um, that we uh, assessed or we appreciated in moving frogs from Sweden was the risk of spreading chytrid. And ironically, in this case, we translocated frogs, which has actually removed them from chytrid. So that was an unexpected result of the translocation. Right, a few points. Um, some of these personal rather than organisational. Um, certainly reintroduction has its place within rewilding. Both rewilding and reintroductions are valuable, useful conservation strategies and tools. Um, and it's in inevitable that rewilding is going to have um, several um, interpretations. Uh, I would suggest that extending the term rewilding to unregulated, unregulated releases is not helpful. Obviously, language is evolving, but the way I would personally look at this is that um, an unregulated release of amphibians, it, it, it's, it's a conservation threat. It's not a useful intervention. So I think it's useful drawing a distinction between rewilding and people just letting things go um, on a bit of a whim or because they quite like them. And I will, again, this is not my organisation. This is not ARC. This is not ARC UK, but I will make a prediction. Sadly, I think it is fairly inevitable that BSAL will enter the wild in the UK and if it does so I think it's inevitably going to come from a cosmopolitan amphibian collection. That will either be somebody undertaking um, an illegal release or it will be somebody who's got these things in their back garden and in contact with wild amphibians. So that's just a fairly pessimistic prediction from me. What can we do about this? Um, well, we've got to recognise that in many different aspects, there are some people that are just never going to change their attitudes. An example of that is uh, considering the issue of moving frogs spawn about. This is our common frogs. Um, people are always um, have been moving these things, uh, frogs spawn about for years. About 25 years or so ago, frog life started putting about the message that actually there are risks entailed to this, so perhaps we shouldn't be doing it. And that message has permeated fairly effectively to a certain level. So if you talk to almost anyone within wildlife conservation circles, they'll say, yep, yeah, we shouldn't be moving frogs spawn about. There are some people um, that that message hasn't permeated to, and that may be because they're just not moving within those circles, or it may be they've heard the message and they just don't want to hear it. But nevertheless, I think it's really important that the counter arguments are put mainstream. So. You know, when I, hold this, I hear all these uh, speculation about unregulated releases of amphibians and quite respectable conservationists and the media saying, yeah, this seems great. We really do need to be putting the counter argument and raising these questions in the public um, sphere. We ought to be saying, yeah, but what about the risks? Have you considered? And uh, pointing out quite how devastating B-cell is. And for those of you that are engaging with these discussions in social media, I'm really grateful to you. Thanks for your effort. Sometimes it may seem a bit fruitless, but it is important and it does have some sort of impact. Again, it's not going to change everyone's um, attitude, but it does create the right sort of environment to be carrying out these discussions. Um, what can we do? Well, it's important we recognise that these unregulated releases, it, it, it stems from the same passion that we all share. 
um, we're all passionate about these um, these animals. That's why we're in conservation. And we've got to recognize that there's a lot of people that keep these things amongst us. So a lot of people listening today, um, uh, including people amongst the amphibian and reptile um, group community, which is ostensibly um, focused on um, conserving these animals in the wild. A lot of us are keeping these things at home. It's a rewarding hobby, but the important thing is, is we should be doing it well. And an example of that, the, um, the uh, measure that we can take is, is going to our advice note seven, talking about how to deal with um, non-native species when you're attending public events. Uh, and that's important. I can give an example of I used to do these sort of things, um, public outreach events uh, a couple of decades ago. What you do is you'd basically there'd be some sort of fair. You take along some animals and you would engage the public in, in conversation, talk to them about the animals. And typically we would take along a python to put in the crowds and we'd take along a handful of slow worms that we were just following from the wild. Mixing those things up now, recognize is not a good idea. So um, if we're gonna keep pets, that's fine, but we've got to do it well and we've got to be aware of the risks. There are some resources um, uh, as, as guidance if you want to get involved in reintroductions or get involved in debate about reintroductions. As we've talked about, the IUCN guidelines, um, they are the textbook, quite heavy going. There's also um, position statements, so amphibian and reptile conservation have got information on the website about bringing back species, reintroductions, translocations and captive breeding. And ARG UK, we've also got a policy statement concerning reintroductions. So those are available on the ARC and the amphibian and reptile group um, websites. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And I don't know if we have time for questions. That's great. Thank you so much, John. And uh, as somebody who's been working in uh, biosecurity for, for many years now, um, I'm, I'm so glad that you put the emphasis on, on that topic within your talk. It really is vitally important that we protect our native species. So, um, yeah, great talk. Thank you. We uh, perhaps have, have a couple of questions um, and then um, I'm sure John will be really pleased to go into the Q&A box and answer some of the other great questions that we've got there. As well. We've got some really good discussions going on, so, so keep it going. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we've got one um, from Sally who asks, uh, how can we regulate monitor mitigation introductions when reptiles and amphibians are relocated so that development can take place? Should this practice be stopped? So that, that question is for John. I'm sorry, I'm based out. Could you can repeat that, please, Nicola? No problem. Yes, uh, Sally asks, can we regulate or monitor mitigation introductions where re reptiles and amphibians are relocated so that development can take place? Um, well, well, we should be doing it, and usually monitoring is often recommended within mitigation strategies, but there's no means or very little means of enforcing it. So, yeah. Definitely, the more monitoring takes place, the better. And in fact, a lot of evaluations of these mitigation exercises are massively hampered by the fact there is no data. So if there is an opportunity to, um, to monitor a mitigation translocation, absolutely do do it, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, John raises a really, really interesting point, actually, very topical at the moment. Um, he asks uh, whether you'd consider that uh, there's a need for a, an effective in the field test for B cell BD um, in, in view of having a warning, early warning system. So he's um, alluding to the tests being currently used for SARS-CoV-2 testing in humans. <laughs> just, um, it would certainly be useful, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely, of course, yeah. Um, with regard to early warning systems though, um, I am a little bit skeptical because even if we find it out there, what are we gonna do? I think the emphasis has gotta be on preventing it getting out there in the first place. I guess if it does get out there, the sooner we know about it, the better. But we shouldn't be looking at um, monitoring the disease in the wild as, as the main strategy. The emphasis has got to be on preventing it getting out in the first place. Yeah. Once it's out, you know, I think we're very limited for options of what to do about it. Great. Thank you, John. I think we're going across to, to a poll now, Angie. Yeah, we are. I think we can see that now, Angie. <laughs> can you see it? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so where species ranges are moving north in response to climate change, should they be actively assisted to cross the English Channel, even if there is no evidence there are previously a native resident species in Britain? That was a little bit contentious, but there we go. So some of the questions that you've been asking have actually been answered in John's talk. He did such a good, 
good job of covering such a large uh, large area of um, discussion there. So so well done for doing that whilst you were giving your presentation, John. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of different issues here. I mean, I think we were saying earlier that you could almost have several mm -hmm. webinars on different aspects of this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And all, all of these points that people are bringing up are valid points that, that need further discussion. And yeah. the only way that we're going to achieve success is by working together. OK, I'm just going to give it another second. We're actually getting over 85 percent of people voting, which is a very high high turnout, so unless it goes to 90. Yeah, I should have perhaps emphasised when I was talking about things that we can do. Um, I, I did mean to say we need to keep channels of communication open. That's really important. You know, we do need to be working to, on this together. We shouldn't yeah, be thinking definitely. about you know, a pet keeper community and a, a conservation community. That doesn't help at all. As I said, you know, we are keepers. You know, we, it does cross over. OK. Right, Nicola, can you read out the answers while I write yeah. them? Okay, so um, yes, um, bring them across was 15%. Uh, no, maintain the channel as a barrier was 59%. And not sure was 26%. So just over a quarter said they weren't sure. And I'm not surprised because as we've already found out this evening, it's a really difficult topic and there aren't any really clear cut answers to this. It very much depends on circumstance and, and species. So um, now we're going to introduce our last speaker, Mark Elliott. So Mark is the lead on the Devon Beaver Project and he works for Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, he, his talk on bringing the beaver back to Britain will look at the impacts of the reintroduction of a keystone species on the landscape and how this affects entire ecosystems, including amphibians. So over to you, Mark. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to come along and talk about beavers tonight, um, mainly because there's quite a lot of crossover, as you'll see, um, with some of the other topics that we've been talking about this evening. Um, but I'm going to start by introducing you to, uh, to the species. This is the Eurasian beaver, um, which is one of the, well, second largest rodent in the world. Um, it's a pretty significant sized animal. A lot of the animals that we're handling here on the River Otter are in excess of 20, 25 kilograms in weight. This one here on the table is about 23 and a half kilograms. Um, native to Britain, uh, and they are a true keystone species, as I'll, um, I'll come on to explain in a bit. Um, hunted to extinction around 400 years ago, primarily for their fur, for their meat, and also for their castorium glands as well. They're entirely herbivorous, so uh, there's no fish in the diet, as I'm sure you're all aware, but many people still aren't. Um, in the summer months, though, they're feeding on soft riverside plants. Um, and then it's more in the winter months that they switch their diets to, uh, to woody trees. So particularly willow, poplar, that sort of thing that live alongside watercourses. Uh, they live in family groups and those families defend territories. And this is one of the main mechanisms by which the, um, the population is controlled. As the, as the population starts to reach carrying capacity within a, within a catchment, then the dispersing two-year-old beavers are, are often uh, killed by other beavers. So that starts to regulate the, um, the population. But having said that, they are still fairly slow to breed. They, they have one litter of kits born in a year, an average of three kits in a litter, but that can vary from one or two all the way up to five or even six. Um, but generally what we're seeing uh, down here in Devon is uh, around three, three or four kits. They are mostly nocturnal. So um, we do see them a little bit in the summer evenings in daylight, but generally, certainly this time of year, they're still nocturnal and they are semi-aquatic, which means they're really living in and around water. Um, this is primarily for safety. They feel they can get away from predators if they if they can get into deep water um, and submerge themselves. And they use water courses um, and deeper water mm -hmm. to transport material like um, logs and, and sticks in order to build their um, their dams and lodges. And they are living in burrows and lodges. And the key thing here is that they have an underwater entrance. And that's one of the other reasons why they want this, this deep water is so that they can have a, have a submerged uh, entrance to that burrow. And if they find themselves somewhere where there isn't deep water, then um, that's really what stimulates them to build dams. And so they will build dams to create ponds 
that they can um, that they can have their burrows and lodges in. So that's just a quick um, quick run through of the ecology. Um, Many of you will be aware that in August last year, the, um, the government made the pretty momentous decision that the beavers living wild on the River Otter would be permitted to remain in perpetuity. And this is essentially the first mammal that's been legally reintroduced into England uh, ever, really. Um, and it marked the end of the River Otter beaver trial, which I'll, I'll obviously talk about in a bit more detail as we go on. But I also just want to explain a little bit about the background to where we got involved with this. Um, back in 2011, in fact, it was 10 years ago this week that we introduced a pair of beavers into an enclosure, so a fence site in, uh, in West Devon. So this is on the other side of the, of the county from the River Otter. Um, it's a three hectare site and it was um, a, a grassland site. And it was a site that was becoming really badly encroached with, with willow and birch scrub. And the primary purpose at that point was to see whether the beavers would help open out the grassland and, and clear some of the scrub. So it was a management tool really, but there was a whole host of research and monitoring that went along with that. Um, and one of the aspects that we looked at in detail was the watercourses and how the watercourses changed over time. And this was done by a team of archeologists um, from Southwest Archeology. span and this is what the site looked like at the start. So it's about 150, no, 180 meters from the top of the site where the watercourse enters the, the enclosure. You can see there's a little bit of a, a watercourse here at the top. Um, it then ran through a release pond that we'd built for the beavers. And then there was a bit more of a watercourse which then uh, goes back under the fence through a culvert here. So it's about 180 meters from top to bottom. Um, so that's what the site looked like when we put the beavers in. Within 10 months, um, the beavers had already started really manipulating this watercourse. So you can see the black lines are the dams. So they'd started to put dams across the, the stream, but they'd also started to canalize it. They'd started to build these, um, these deeper channels um, interconnecting these pools. So that's within the first year. Year two, it looked like this. So you can see now this, um, this dam at this top end is about 30, 35 meters in length. So it's really quite a significant structure. You've got a lot of lateral canals coming out sideways as well. And this enables the beavers to feed away from the main watercourse, um, collect their willow, and then head back into the, into the safety of the deeper water. So by having these canals, they can extend their, their feeding limits, if you like. Um, and then over the course of the next few years, you can see the site gets gradually more and more complex and wetter and uh, increasingly suitable for beavers and everything else. Uh, and this is what the site looks like now. So uh, this was taken uh, about three months ago now, and it gives you an idea of just how dramatic the, um, the change has been really. There was no open water on this site at all to speak of back at the beginning. I'll just run that again. Um, but you can see these beaver dams here. Um, and you can see the, the, the water courses that, um, or the water bodies that have been created by this, um, this incredible keystone species. Um, and obviously there's been a huge range of, of uh, changes to the ecology as a result of that. And one of the species that we've looked at is the common frog. So this is my single amphibian slide for this talk. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, the, the clumps of frog spawn, which is the way we were measuring the population, we were counting clumps of frog spawn every year and we had 10 clumps at the very beginning and we were up to 681 clumps by 2017. So you can see there's been a really significant increase in, um, in frog populations. And obviously they're the bottom of the food chain um, and, uh, and, and lots of things like to eat frogs and tadpoles. And so there's been a, an increase in grass snakes and increase in herons, all sorts of species that then come in and feed on those frogs. Um, I won't talk in much detail about what happened after um, 2017. This is basically the beast from the east. Um, and so we had a, a mass freezing event after much of the frog spawn had been laid. And as you can see, there was a significant impact on the frog population as a result of that. I expect many of you came across the same thing in other parts of the country. So over to the River Otter. Um, as John's mentioned, this, um, this River Otter Beaver Trial actually started as an unlicensed release. Um, beavers were found to be living on the River Otter 
in 2014, and they were shown to be breeding in 2014. And that stimulated the government to propose to round them up because no one quite knew where they'd come from. There was a concern that they might be carrying a, a parasite called Echinococcus multilocularis, which is a, a little tapeworm, which we don't have in Britain, but which is found in mainland Europe. And because there was a concern that these animals could have come from, um, from Europe, um, they were proposing to round them up and remove them. But there was a big local campaign by, by people who lived in the valley and across the country saying, look, we want to keep our beavers. You know, the, we've, got, we've become very attached to these beavers. And at this point, Devon Wildlife Trust stepped in and with a group of partners, including Derek Gow, um, University of Exeter and one of the major landowners, Clinton Devon Estates, we proposed this trial. Um, excuse me a minute. Um, and the idea was that we would try and look in detail at the impact of the beavers on the river system and particularly how the, how the, how the impacts of the beavers would interact with the, the people that live and work in the valley. Um, so the trial, we were granted the license in 2015 to run this five-year trial. It covered the entire River Otter catchment, so it's about 250 kilometres squared. So it's not a huge catchment, but it's a reasonable size. And the beavers were not permitted to leave the catchment. So they were allowed to go anywhere within the, within the river system. But if they turned up in any of the adjacent watercourses, then we were under uh, a requirement to go and retrieve them. And there was a, a science and evidence forum which collected uh, a lot of the data. Preferred, um, that was chaired by Professor Richard Brazier from the University of Exeter. And the final report from that, uh, that piece of work and from the forum is, uh, is now online, so you can view it on the University of Exeter website. Um, there's a link there. Uh, and I'll obviously talk about some of the findings from that um, over the next few minutes. The other key document that we produced um, towards the end of the trial was this Beaver Management Strategy Framework, which is a bit of a mouthful. Basically, it outlines how we will manage the beaver population and the, the impacts of those beavers um, after 2020 in the event that they were permitted to remain. So these documents formed the basis of the evidence that we, um, we presented to the government that allowed them to make the decision that the beavers could remain last, October, last August. So at the start of the trial, because there was this concern about the, the health status of the animals, the government um, rounded up the main adult beavers that were in the population, and they were then subject to a, um, a detailed health examination. So that included uh, uh, endoscopic examinations internally, primarily looking for signs of a kind of coccus parasite on the liver, but there was a whole range of other tests that were conducted at the same times. Um, and during the course of the trial, there was ongoing health monitoring. We were taking samples from the beavers during the course of the trial, and, um, and that was subject to really detailed examination by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Um, and the work was led by Dr. Rasheen Campbell-Palmer, who's probably the country's leading expert on beavers and beaver health issues particularly. Um, and their conclusion was that the, the beavers presented no significant risk to human livestock or other wildlife health, and they were healthy and thriving in the River Otter. So that was a really key part of the, of the trial, particularly in the early stages, um, because of the, um, the concerns that had been expressed about the, the health. Um, at the beginning of the trial, we had two family groups of beavers living in the lower reaches of the River Otter. So this is a map of the catchment. So for those of you who um, who know the area, we've got Budley Salterton down here at the, at the mouth of the river. We've got Honiton, which is here on the A30. Um, Ottery St Mary is somewhere about here. And the beavers were living at the start in the deeper waters, in the, in the middle reaches of the river, where they didn't need to do any major engineering, they didn't need to build dams, they were quite happy in the living in the deeper water of the river. Um, over the course of the trial, though, that population expanded, and by the end, we were up to 13 um, territories, um, so from two to 13 over the course of um, five years. And these are data that we collect um, by, obviously we're not really in a position to, um, to monitor the individual animals anymore. So we're, we're using feeding signs, so particularly feeding on willow and other, um, other trees alongside the rivers to generate these data. And it's allowing us to, um, to map where in the catchment the animals are living. So by, by the end of the trial in March 2019, 
this is the distribution of the of the animals um, and we have had one one more survey done subsequently and as you can see they really are spreading now into some of the other tributaries um, and they've really colonized the catchment really well there's a long way to go but they have they've certainly colonized the main water courses Beavers are really famous for building dams, and this is probably one of the biggest issues that, um, that many people have with beavers. These dams are quite significant structures, and they're building these, as I say, in order to um, create this deeper water that en enables them to have these underwater burrow entrances, and so that they can move through the safety of this deep water. Um, but one of the key things is that beavers don't build dams everywhere, and um, as part of the trial, the University of Exeter produced this model which shows where in the River Otter catchment the beavers are most likely to build dams and where, where the watercourses have got the, the physical characteristics that enable them to build dams. And um, the actual main watercourse, the main channel itself, isn't suitable for damming at all, and that's exactly what we've seen. But where you do expect to see dams built is in these little headwater streams and the tributaries um, up, in the, up in the Blackdown Hills here. And, uh, and in the smaller watercourses. And that's exactly what we've seen. Um, it's been a really interesting exercise. And again, one of the key messages really that we've been trying to get across is that they're not gonna be building dams in the main rivers. Um, and so some of the concerns about fish migration, for example, which are often talked about, are really not as significant as some people think they're gonna be. Um, what we've seen is that the dams in the higher energy streams, so where those bigger watercourses are being dammed, the, the dams are really quite dynamic. They're, they're coming and going a lot. They get washed out. They get moved around as a result of the flows. Um, and we did do a, a snapshot survey of all of the, the whole catchment in 2019. And we found that we had a total of 28 dams in six of the beaver territories at that point. So that just gives you an idea of, um, of the proportion of the, of the territories where dam building was actually taking place. Now, um, in the lower energy watercourses, and this tends to be in the ditch systems and the, um, in the sort of the, the more heavily modified uh, man-made watercourses, the dams can be more permanent. Uh, and it's generally because you haven't got the stream flows that are, that are washing them out. And in these low gradient systems, particularly in some of the floodplain ditches, um, this is where dams can cause some of the biggest conflicts as well. So, um, so we've got agricultural land here and a relatively small dam can actually have quite a significant impact on a fairly large area of um, of agricultural land here. Um, so, and these are these are often the dams that are quite difficult to manage as well because of the low gradients. Um, on another site, we've been looking at the uh, the impacts of the dams on flood peaks, and this again is work by the University of Exeter. We've got a really nice beaver wetland in here that's been created just upstream of a community that floods uh, in the lower part of the River Otter. And each of these um, little dots on the graph here is uh, a flood event. And what we've done is we've been able to, because there's an Environment Agency gauging station just here upstream of the, the, the flood risk um, village, we've been able to look how the flood risk has changed since the beavers were, um, were introduced into this stream. And so the red line is the flood risk before the beavers went in and the blue line is the flood risk after the beavers went in and had, had, had a chance to modify this watercourse. And you can see that there is a lower flood peak uh, after, the, um, after the beavers have been put in, primarily because the sequence of dams that are being constructed slow the flow of water, spread the water out sideways uh, and basically reduce the, um, the, the height of the peak and increasing the, um, the lag time. So it's really quite a, an important finding. Um, we found, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, significant impacts on agriculture on five sites. So this is the same site actually from a different angle. So you can actually see the beaver dam just here, the other side of the beaver dam here. Um, but you can imagine that if you're the dairy farmer here, this is a significant impact on your fields. Um, we also found Riverside made, maize had been impacted in three of the beaver territories as well. Not a significant financial impact, um, but actually what they were doing, because they were, it was attracting them to these areas and they were building dams in the watercourse in order to access the maize. Um, and they were also putting burrows into the riverbank underneath the maize 
there was a, a risk that um, the harvesters were going to fall into the beaver burrows and collapse the chambers. Um, and there was, as well as the risk to the beavers, there was a significant risk to the, um, to the agricultural machinery as well. So one of, the, one of the key things that we're saying as a result of the end of the trial is that it's vital that good quality, pragmatic advice and support is available to landowners and property owners um, where you've got beavers moving into a, a new area. There's a whole suite of um, management interventions that we can, we can do. We can protect trees. We can install beaver deceivers or flow devices. There's a whole range of things that we can do in order to mitigate some of these impacts, but you've got to have people on the ground providing this advice and support. Another key finding was that um, landowners need to be financially rewarded for providing space for watercourses. You know, if we're going to see these, um, these beaver wetlands created, um, then the landowners have got to be providing a bit more space to these watercourses and, um, and there needs to be financial support for that. So that's a, that's a really important finding. And another thing is because it's particularly with beavers, there's a lot of myths and legends around beavers um, and providing good quality uh, information and, and public engagement programs, again, is a really key part of bringing this animal back. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what it does and what it doesn't do. So, um, so this is a, a key part of what we do here in Devon at the moment. Now, there's a whole range of different projects um, happening around the country with beavers. Um, there's a number of other unlicensed populations out there, including over here on the River Tamar. We've got um, beavers living out in the Stour catchment in Kent. Um, there's beavers on the Y. There's various other pockets of, of wild beavers as well. And there's also a lot of fenced sites now, new fence sites and sites that have been in existence for a number of years, including the very first site in Kent, which is the Ham Fen, which was, which was the first site in England, which was, um, which was started in 2003, I think. So beavers have been in this country a long time now. So we're just waiting now for a, a consultation from the government um, and that will that's due out in the spring. And that's gonna look at the legal status of beavers in the country. It will uh, determine whether beavers can be released elsewhere. It will ex um, explore what will happen to the other wild populations that exist. Uh, and it will also talk about the resources that, that will need to be made available to support landowners. Um, and to support advisory work within the catchments. And I think that's probably it from me. So, um, so thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so much, Mark. That was, that was brilliant. Um, I've obviously heard you um, speak on the subject before, um, but once again, I found out lots of new information. So yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and particularly important to, to hear about um, all of the impacts um, and not just positive ones, some that other you know, landowners may seem as, as a little contentious. So it's really important to get that balanced view. Great, thank you. Um, we have got lots and lots of questions coming in. We don't have time for, for too many, I don't think at the moment before we run the next poll, um, but one which stands out really as being particularly important for our audience this evening um, comes from Pete, who asks whether the heat generated from beaver lodges has the potential to incubate grass snake eggs. Well, wow, that's an interesting one. Um, not something I've ever come across, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, <clears throat> what tends to happen in the autumn is the beavers put a huge amount of extra material on top of the, the lodge, sort of it's, it's sort of insulating material really. And that can include quite a lot of, of soil, um, roots of um, soft rush, all sorts of vegetation that's collected from the um, from the side of the of the water, so yeah, potentially, yeah, you could imagine that um, the grass snakes would use them. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, there's a few questions about genetics as well. So, given that uh, some of these populations are quite small and isolated, and also we do um, have a few um, shall we say unintentional releases and perhaps unofficial releases, what are the risks in terms of genetic diversity and maybe bottleneck and bottlenecking? Well, I'll just mention the beavers quickly because I know that's quite a, an interesting one for a lot of people. We have been granted a license to bring new beavers into the River Otter because of the concerns about inbreeding. Um, but longer term, I think, you know, there is a risk that um, uh, that they they do become inbred. And so moving animals between catchments is going to be important, obviously bearing in mind the IUCN guidelines and transfer of disease and that sort of thing. Great. Great. 
Um, Angie, did you want to run with the poll now? We can answer a few more questions as we're going. Yeah, I can do the poll and you can still chat. Uh, okay, um, lots and <laughs> lots of questions coming in now. So um, several about uh, human conflict as well. So um, how have you found that situation with landowners and potential human conflict, Mark? Um, most of the conflicts have been fairly straightforward to manage. There's been one or two that have been difficult, um, but actually it's this information that once people have got the accurate information about what they're dealing with, people seem to relax. Um, there are clearly going to be sites where it's very difficult to, um, to make everybody happy. And one of the, probably the most difficult site that we've had is where we've got a beaver population living on a site where the landowner is delighted about it and wants to see the beavers creating their wetlands and, and storing water and doing all the great things that they're doing. And the landowner upstream is suffering from raised water levels in their water course and doesn't want the beavers there and is really angry about it. So this is probably, it's, it's again, it's a people issue rather than a beaver issue more than anything else. Um, but yeah, that's probably the site that we've had the greatest problems with. Great. Um, John asks has, uh, about amphibian monitoring over the, the river catchment. Yeah, um, unfortunately we're in um, the part of Devon which doesn't have very many crested newts. Um, they're just, you know, they're on the, the edge of their range there in that part of, of East Devon. Um, we've done amphibian, we've done common frog monitoring uh, in very low numbers in, uh, in one site, um, but it's not even been anything like as systematic as we did in the enclosure. Um, there's not really been the resources to do as much amphibian monitoring as it would have been nice to. We're just, we're doing um, uh, eDNA work. Uh, on crested newts in in one site as well but other than that the amphibians haven't had a had a huge amount of work um, and the same with reptiles really um, we've certainly seen a, a significant increase in grass snakes on one site it was a good site for grass snakes anyway but you you can almost not go onto that site now without tripping over them um, and it is a site that we've seen a, a big increase in in toads particularly so we think that's probably what's going on there. But again, it's not been systematically studied. Great. Thanks, Mark. Angie, did you want to go through the, the poll now? Yeah, I'll just quickly say, so we were last poll was uh, specifically about IUCN guidelines and whether people believe that they should be adhered to for the letter or whether they should be advisory or whether they should be entirely ignored. And so what we're finding here is that people do value them. 46% uh, think they're very important, should be followed carefully. 47%, which is slightly more in fact, think that they're more of a guide, to help projects identify issues and processes. 1% uh, believes they're far too bureaucratic and should be ignored. And 13% are not sure. And I think, again, that's fair enough because these are quite technical issues. And uh, I think the one thing I've discovered from from rewilding is that the, the more I hear, the, the the more the more the less I know almost. So um, thank you to everyone for that. Great, thanks, Angie. Um, have we got time to open up the discussion to all panelists, Angie? Or we've run out well, of time now. I mean, if people don't mind staying, we've still got two hundred twenty-four people here. So yep. uh, great. Okay, um, let's just have a look through some of these questions. Um, mm. So, uh, okay, so we've got, um, there is one actually on, on beavers again, and um, this one's for you, Mark, from Elliot, who asks whether um, the enclosed trials for beavers are still useful, or, or when do you think the fences will come down completely with free living beavers allowed nationally? Well, that's the big question, I guess, and that really depends on this government consultation, um, and we'll hopefully know more in the coming few months, um, or at least what the thinking of government is. I mean, there are, there, are, there is a role for fenced sites, um, often in establishing populations within a catchment anyway. Um, if you just release beavers straight into a, into a river, then they will move to where they want to be. And often that's not where you want them to be um, in the first instance, particularly if you're using them as a, a flood mitigation tool, for example. Um, so actually starting them off in fenced enclosures can be quite a, quite a useful way of getting them into a catchment and also giving gives people an opportunity to come and see them, come and understand what they do. So they can be quite a good first step in just starting the conversation about what beavers do and whether, you know, how they behave um, as a sort of precursor to a wider release into a catchment. 
Great, thank you. Um, a few questions about volunteering. So there is one from Anushka on volunteering with the Beaver Project, but we've had other requests from people who were interested in getting involved in, con in conservation and ecology generally. So is this something that the B Devon Beaver Project offers, Mark? Not really. I mean, we have used volunteers for some of the more laborious tasks like wrapping trees in, um, in fencing materials and removing beaver dams from time to time. Um, but we recruited a lot of volunteers at the beginning of the of the trial and then really didn't make much use of them. Um, and I think that was probably a, probably a mistake, really. Um, I think, you know, there is a role for using a small number of, of highly skilled volunteers, but there isn't really as much scope for um, for lots of volunteers to get involved, at least at this point when we're, you know, where we're dealing with um, with sensitive landowner issues, particularly it can be quite you know, it can be quite sensitive work and it's it's hard to have um, volunteers getting involved with a lot of those sites. Great. Um, and then going back to some of the more general questions from earlier on in the evening, some of those have been answered by some of our panellists already. Um, Pan asked a question about encouraging native wildlife to the community pond. Um, it sounds as though um, from his question that there might be quite a bit of um, rubbish in this pond and maybe just needs a really good tidy up. But um, can you give some top tips on encouraging native species to, to, to go into the, the pond? And that's open to any panelist who would like to answer. Anybody got any answers? I think my, my suggestion would be to try and work with the local community to try and tidy the pond up in the first instance and to try and uh, get those the local people to kind of take ownership for it really. Um, and act as guardians for the pond. Um, and also um, make sure that you've got connectivity as well. So if people can dig ponds in their own gardens, that's always a great thing um, to, to actually increase that connectivity as well. Okay, um, other questions. Um, there's one uh, generally on um, how big an effect, so this is June asks, how big an effect do you think disturbance and killing by cats and dogs has on the loss of common amphibians and reptiles. So I can answer from my perspective and say that uh, particularly in um, isolated areas where you have a high feral cat population, they can decimate native species. And certainly in Ireland, um, some, some of the island populations of bats have been completely decimated by feral cats and they've had to have a control program. Uh, so um, yeah, I, my, my thoughts are that, that dogs and cats certainly do have a major impact um, has anybody else got anything to contribute to that? Yeah. Angie, sorry, could you take the poll down, do you think? I'm having a job to see hands raised. Yeah, Nicola? Yeah, uh, Chris, yeah Chris has got his hand up. Uh, just briefly, when I used to, used to work for HCT, we had a student one summer. We got her to go knocking on all the doors of all the houses all around some of the big Heathland nature reserves in Bournemouth and Poole. And she found that virtually all of them who had cats reported, yep, our cat brings in lizards and snakes and slow worms. So around nature reserves, there'll be a huge uh, impact, but that's only within a first few hundred metres, which is why the rule for internationally protected sites is no new houses within 400 metres um, for the extra, extra pressure and the extra pressure from cats and things as well. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, and John? Yeah, I was going to say, whenever I've looked at the studies of what cats are preying on in, in the United Kingdom, I'm always surprised at how low the incidence of amphibian and reptile predation seems to be. But I suspect it's entirely due to the locations where these studies are carried out. And as Chris says, if you've got cats bordering a nature reserve where there's reptiles, it, it seems inevitable they're going to hammer them. Yeah. But the published stuff, yeah, really weak evidence. Okay, lovely. Um, thanks, John. So Laura asked, which species would you think would be good candidates for reintroduction? And would the novel habitats they will now face be in any way detrimental? Open to the panel. You're muted, Chris. Um, I, again, I think we've got so much to be dealing with in terms of habitat, trying to get habitat right for existing species. And again, even though I work on a reintroduction project, 
I do think that they're fairly low down the list. <laughs> I mean, the pool frog's pretty significant. We've proved it went extinct in the 1990s. And something that went extinct 500 years ago, possibly due to climate change, probably less a priority. I wouldn't rule it out, but just less a priority. So for that reason, I don't give it a lot of thought. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with you. I think that our, our first thoughts should be towards um, managing habitat and, and creating suitable habitat if there's even a, a thought to, to be reintroducing species, because we need to introduce the species, the species into a sustainable environment where they're, they're going to have a chance of surviving. So great, thank you. Um, Lots of comments about um, joining the local ARGs, which obviously we support. So if you if you have a, a local ARG, then do get in touch with them. Um, then uh, we're, we're always happy to offer advice to, to people um, about your own ponds and gardens, but also in the wider community as well. Um, and there's also lots of links going on in the chat on um, uh, habitat management. So do have a look at those. And I, I, again, I think that's the most important thing is that we get those habitats right um, for people, uh, for the species. Um, so there is a, there's another one on, on beavers actually um, here. So um, Jerome asks, any concern about beaver wetland creation causing predatory fish to enter newt ponds through what rising water levels and river overflowing into ponds? So Mark, any thoughts on that? Um, certainly not something that we've seen at all. Um, I would say that probably what tends to happen is a lot of beaver ponds are temporary. They're not necessarily permanent features, so they don't necessarily always get um, colonized by fish um, but what you're often getting is uh, clusters of ponds so lots of ponds in a relatively small area like we've seen in our enclosure um, and I think we've probably got um, bullheads in one or two of those ponds but we've now got there's probably about 50 ponds in total now within that um, two hectare area um, so in terms of uh, an amphibian resource, breeding resource, um, and if it was in another part of the country, it would be an amazing Great Crested Newt site. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a big issue myself. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feed feedback. I hope you can't hear that. Um, OK, great. Uh, I think probably a lot of the other questions that we've got coming in here have been answered. but. Um, OK, so we've got another one from Leslie, again, on the same same lines as one of the previous ones. Does the panel think you should plant up new ponds or allow them to naturally regenerate? Does it depend on how close they are to other ponds? Um, well, my first comment would be always to allow natural regeneration, if at all possible. Um, I, I've spent a lot of my career as an invasion biologist clearing up um, after people have unwittingly introduced invasive non-native species into those ponds. So the exotic plants, which are often available in um, garden centres, they haven't all been uh, banned from sale. So you can still buy some which are actually invasive and non-native. Um, and so uh, we, as a customer, you wouldn't necessarily know that that was going to be the problem. But the problem with introducing these uh, plants is that it very often renders the ponds completely unsuitable for native species, both in terms of flora and fauna. So natural regeneration is always the best way, in my opinion. Um, and also sharing plants between friends and relatives can also be quite hazardous because you run the risk of spreading disease and also invasive plant fragments as well. So that's my thoughts on that. Anything else anybody else would like to add? I think it might depend on the nature of the ponds. If we're talking about a small preformed pond in a garden, um, I think you could wait a long time before that colonises naturally. So I can see that you might want to put weed in there. Of course, the advantage of that sort of situation is if you do get something in there that's invasive, because it's a small pond, you can control it all. Um, if you are putting a pond on a nature reserve, then I would say no, let natural recolonization take place. Yeah, completely. I was just going to add that if you, uh, unless you're an expert in um, all of the invasive plants that are present in the UK at the moment, why would you take the risk? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, it's it's quite difficult as well to purchase plants from um, places which which uh, you can actually explain completely where their um, stock has come from um, and, and and label correctly. So I'm not suggesting that all of the um, the retail outlets are the same, but um, they, they, we often get comments from people um, saying that they bought plants and didn't realise what they were buying or buy plants with invasive plant fragments in them. So it's quite a difficult one. 
Okay. Um, any other last comments that any of the panelists have seen that they'd like to answer? Nicola, I'm just looking at, uh, there's uh, one question from Sally uh, about uh, impacts on native freshwater fish, uh, oh, yeah. which I, it's quite a hot topic actually, um, because there is concern that um, some of the salmon anglers particularly have raised that fish, um, fish passage is impeded by beaver dams. Um, we have looked at it in a fair amount of detail on one in one area. The, the biggest thing that we've found actually is that in the main rivers there's there's not been the construction of beaver dams um, as I mentioned earlier on and therefore the impact on um, migrating fish doesn't seem to be a significant one. Um, having said that it's still something that people are concerned about and in the headwater streams where we have studied um, fish populations around beaver dams what we've seen is that it's the dynamism of these dams coming and going that is generating habitats, particularly for species like bullheads and brown trout. Um, so the new gravels that are created as beaver dams um, wash out, those are the areas that then become the spawning gravels for the, for the trout that find themselves in these areas. Um, so we have seen quite a significant increase in, in diversity and the size of some fish populations around beaver sites. But it's a it's a huge potential area of research, and I think you know we we can't claim to know even ten percent of the answer to that question really. Oh, I'm just interested because a large number of beavers have been shot in Scotland, or there's a lot of publicity given to that. Is that because of fears about fishing? Do you think? No, it's primarily because the beavers are living in um, an area of really productive. Um, particularly potato farming land in the Tayside catchment. And it's a very flat landscape. It's very intensively farmed. Um, and the, the drainage systems are critical for the, for the agriculture. And the beavers are coming into that area and they're blocking the, the ditches. They're burrowing into flood banks and they're basically interfering with what is a very heavily modified landscape. Um, and the landowners in, in the early days certainly had absolutely no support, no advice from, from people on the management of, of those beaver problems. Um, and so they have now, you know, they've been lobbying hard for beavers to be, um, to be controlled and they, they are now getting licenses to, to either move or shoot beavers. And that's what's happened up there, despite them being a, a European protected species in Scotland. Very true. I've got quite a lot of beavers around me and some of the farmers modify the landscape to try and discourage them um, from staying as well, which is great. Thank you. Um, Dennis asked, should the government nationalise some areas of land purely for rewilding? Yes. Short and sweet answer. <laughs> I don't think any of us would, would disagree with that one. Um, Harvey says, why is the base the baseline, say, 150 years ago, when we know that by that point the UK was already heavily modified? Uh, why are other European countries striving for restoration to the Bronze or early Holocene when the nature was still intact? What's the rationale? I'm not, uh, 150 years ago, I'm not sure what the reference to that one was. Does anybody want to pick up on that question? Chris, you're moving. I was wondering if I could just mention some of the sort of legal and policy framework um, around this, because it does vary between different UK nations. But in Scotland, it's not even as simple as looking at what was present 150 years ago or whichever benchmark you want. Um, if a species is lost from part of its range for whatever reason, um, then that no longer, that might count as part of its natural range, but not part of its native range anymore. And so it becomes a case that you are reintroducing a species to an area of land that it had previously been on within living memory. And it gets quite complicated. So it really is something that you do need to look into the country policy on, I think. Great. Thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, anybody see any other things that uh, we haven't covered? There's, I know there's, there's loads lot. of questions. Um, there's one uh, about Patagonia from James that I just wanted to mention actually, yeah. if that's all right. Um, so yeah, absolutely true that in uh, Southern Chile and Argentina, um, the North American beaver was reintroduced down there, um, primarily for fur farming and it's escaped and has spread uh, pretty significantly. And one of the key things down there is that the, 
Um, the forests that it's feeding on are these southern beech forests. They don't coppice in response to being fed on by beavers. And where the beavers are creating these big flooded areas, they are drowning out these, um, these old growth forests. And so um, they are having a significant negative effect. And it is quite a good example of what happens if you put the wrong species in the wrong place. Um, you know, this is down there, it's, an, it's a non-native invasive species um, and, and really needs to be treated in the same way. What we're doing here in, in, in Europe is reintroducing a, a native species, which uh, is a key part of our ecosystem. And so a whole range of other species are um, reliant on it. Uh, and the way it feeds on willow and poplar and, and aspen particularly, um, you know, is a really important part of how it exists in this country and how those um, the other species exist with it. So it's a really quite a, quite a contrasting um, situation. And, it, you know, the, the South American example is a is a classic case of a, of a problem non-native species. Thanks, Mark. Um, Elliot asks, where can I get more information about the beaver consultation? Uh, it hasn't been launched yet. We're waiting for it to come out. So I think you'll probably hear about it on from DEFRA. There'll be there'll be quite a lot of publicity about it. Um, it could be any time in the next few months, though. So um, but yeah, keep an eye on the on the media. But yeah, there'll be an opportunity to comment on on all the questions that they raise, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, and then Laura asks, if we take e ecosystem goods and services into account, is rewilding or farming more economically beneficial? Who wants to take that one? I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, again, it's case by case, isn't it? But um, I'm sure, you know, if you go down to the, the NEP estate, and I know Penny, Penny's on the, um, the, the um, call here tonight, um, you know, the impacts that they've seen, the, the financial benefits that they've seen down there in terms of the numbers of people that are coming to, to NEP, you know, they're, they're really significant. We've seen the same thing here in Devon, loads of people coming to see the beavers benefiting lots of local businesses. Um, and that's, that's just the ecotourism benefits. You've got a huge range of other um, ecosystem services from flood relief to soil regeneration, carbon sequestration, there's a whole range of benefits. Um, so it's just about trying to quantify those, but yeah, there's a very, very clear, very strong case for, for rewilding of, of landscapes, definitely. Is um, rewilding a component of the new elm system? I don't know the system so well, but... We don't know yet. But there's a, again, there's a lot, of, um, there's a lot of, of lobbying going on for it to be included, but I'm not aware that um, how successful that's been yet. That does seem to be an opportunity, doesn't it? Now we've broken free from the common agricultural policy. Maybe some good can come of this. <laughs> uh, Marianne's in Denmark, um, setting up 15 rewilding sites on Forestry Commission state managed land and asks how um, large an area would you need to sustain beavers? Uh, that's a good question. So in our enclosure, we've been able to sustain a family group of beavers quite successfully uh, in a, I mean, in total, it's a three hectare site, but they're living really only, only feeding in two hectares of that. Um, it was a very complex site full of food. Um, and the key thing about, you know, if the habitat's right, then they um, they live very much in harmony with the habitat and they are constantly regenerating um, willow by coppicing it. So it does depend a lot on the habitat that's there. You know, there are a lot of river systems that are very devoid of, of good quality vegetation and where they, they would struggle to support many beavers. Um, and then other areas that would be, that are incredibly rich and that would support large numbers. So obviously the answer is as many times it depends Great. Uh, Martin asks a question which actually um, we could probably ask again um, in, in years to come. Is there any evidence that native trees in the UK have adapted or evolved in conjunction with beavers? Um, yes, there is. I mean, it, things like willow are responding really well to being coppiced. Um, and we've almost certainly learnt our coppicing of uh, of species like hazel and willow from watching beavers doing it. Um, I'm not quite sure how the timeline works in terms of evolution, co-evolution. I mean, beavers have been around a very long time. Um, you know, it is millions of years. And so I suspect that willow has evolved with beavers in that ecosystem. 
Great, thank you, Mark. Um, oh, and uh, Pete asks, would a class license enable landowners to deal with beavers should they cause issues? That's quite a technical question relating to the habitats regulations. So uh, that's what we've been uh, aiming for down here in the event that they become a European protected species, then yeah, a class li license would probably be exactly what would allow us to manage conflicts without with, with minimal bureaucracy. Um, so I think that could well be the, the way to go if they become a European protected species in England. Obviously in Scotland, they have become uh, an EPS. Um, and I'm not sure quite how the licensing system works up there. I'm not the right person to ask. It's, licensing up here is quite different from in England. And it's, it's, in some ways, it's similar to how England used to be some time ago. And things tend to be done on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, so and licensing is, does theoretically need to be applied for, but it can be. I think the key thing is that if it's done within a framework, so everybody's agreed on the, the approach that you take and the steps that you take. Um, I mean, what we've what we've proposed on the River Otter is that you have a, a, a sort of tiered system, if you like, and you start with information and education, um, and that actually deals with a huge proportion of conflicts. Um, you then talk about um, financial support for landowners to allow beavers to make space. Um, and then ultimately you talk about mitigation and then and then removal and translocation if you've got places to put them. Um, and, you know, potentially in the longer term, you might be talking about lethal control. But, you know, that's really if you've got nowhere that you can move beavers to and the population's really getting very significant in places. So we're hopefully we're many decades away from that in England. Great. Thank you. Uh so I think I think we've kind of drawn to a close. Um, we've 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 got done two hours this evening, which is uh, quite a stint, I think. Um, it's been a really good evening. Some absolutely fantastic questions, interesting debate, and uh, it's good to have so many people um, with different views and opinions on this, all working together to try to find uh, answers to the questions that we have. So thank you, um, thank you to all the panelists um, here this evening. Um, and to everybody for attending. And now I'm gonna hand you back to Angie. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, it's been fabulous to enable such a brilliant conversation actually, and also to bring together people with different expertise and experiences and just have that sort of flow of conversation. So many thanks to the panelists, many thanks to everybody that came and made it so uh, interesting actually. I think we've all learned something. And um, I can't promise when the next seminar will be, but <laughs> I'll let you all know when we do. And uh, we look forward to that. So I'm going to share the end screen now and wish you all good night. <laughs> <laughs>